anybody who's waiting, good idea. Plug the book and get this book. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Victor is going to be speaking soon, but if you haven't already, Leah's got it. <laughs> if you haven't already read this, um, I suggest you get it and you keep it um, and you look at it often because there's a lot of beautiful information in this book. So I'm really grateful for it. <laughs> And I know they sell it at Harbour Bookshop here locally. So, yeah. yeah. And if you want to get a sexy shirt, we've um, we've brought in supermodel Gav <laughs> to display. So, look at that. Check that out that. We for sale online. <laughs> we'll put the links up to that later. So, um, whoever's lucky enough to already be in here, beautiful Leah, who is going to be talking to us is the artist of the beautiful artwork that's on our poster. Um, it's just absolutely gorgeous and I'll let her explain that to everyone later but it's, there's going to be t-shirts available for purchase and hoodies as well which we'll put the link up for so which is pretty exciting. Yeah cool. Okay so um, can everyone hear okay? Let's see if you can put in the comments. The sound's working fine. Yep, all good, all good, good. Awesome. All right, guys, welcome to uh, the first of this six-part series on Indigenous cultural burning. Um, pretty excited. Um, we, we really couldn't wait to get this get this happening. And um, with everyone being so busy, it took us a while, but we got there in the end. So, um, yeah, I'm Dean from Treading Lightly. And, um, yeah, we're really privileged. Um, Mon's on here too. Um, to, to have these, these speakers on here talking about this um, important issue and we really want to bring it to the forefront. And um, I think um, everyone that's on here will probably agree that if um, what we experienced last summer, um, if that hasn't raised this issue and realised how important it is um, to reconnect with the land and bring in these practices and share this, um, you know, these words of wisdom and get educated um, I don't know what will. So, um, yeah, Mon, would you like to introduce yourself and um, how you feel about this? Yeah, sure. So probably um, if you don't already know who I am, I'm the president, president and founder of Treading Lightly. Um, and our mission is to connect and care for Earth. And we really are passionate about doing that um, alongside and with our Indigenous elders of not only our community, but across the nation. And um, this is something that I personally am really, uh, I feel very privileged to be able to receive this knowledge from our, our um, Indigenous people. And um, tonight, I just really want to give gratitude for the fact that uh, we have so many incredible, incredible people lined up for this webinar. And tonight, the, the panellists that you're going to be introduced to shortly, I feel really honoured. I actually feel a bit starstruck, to be honest. So, um, yeah, this is something that I got. I was very lucky to uh, listen to Uncle Victor Stephenson speak at uh, uh, something that was organised here locally. And I know you're going to just love every word that comes out of his mouth, as well as Leah and Gavin and Uncle Nook. So... Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everybody who's taken the time out tonight, especially at dinner time, to come and uh, listen and learn and be part of the yarn. And um, I just would like to do a little bit of housekeeping before we pass over and get started. Um, and that is just, A, if everybody, you know, which I know everybody will already be really mindful and respectful of everybody's... Um, yeah, I guess beliefs and values and throughout the period of people asking questions and stuff like that. Don't be afraid to ask questions because sure enough, whatever question you have is probably something that's on everybody else's lips. And um, also if you could make sure your microphones stay muted, which I'm, I'm sure they will anyway. And yeah, just really take the time to listen and um, as Uncle Noel Butler had once said to me, we have 
to yeah. us for looking two ears for listening and one mouth for speaking. And this is a really perfect opportunity to practice that. So, um, yeah, I, I really want to thank all of you. So thanks for being here tonight. Um, Uncle Nook, I'm going to hand over to you to introduce yourself because, yeah, I think you were one of the most integral parts of Fire Stick Alliance and cool, cool burning practices here on our south coast. So, yeah, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Well, I want to hear anyone would go tomorrow. Go. Welcome, many friends. Um, firstly, just that uh, acknowledge Taipan um, by knowledge and um, teaching and the work of Uncle Victor Stephenson um, through his mentorship, his generosity, his skills and his knowledge to come down and work with practitioners down here and develop that skill set and the capacity for us to manage land um, traditional way, you know, um, and looking after country. I'm one of the local fire stick practitioners down here. I've been working with local communities now for a number of years to build the capacity and to bring um, fire practice back on country. Um, we do that with fire as medicine to heal country. So not only do we heal country, we heal people and we heal communities. Um, in saying that, I'd just like to now hand over to our host, um, Aladala Local Lauk and um, Treading Light Incorporation. And um, yeah, you're in for a treat and yeah, enjoy the show. And um, yeah, and um, it's a privilege to be sitting here today and, and sharing this knowledge experience with you. And um, I have one hope, um, it's a big aspiration, but if we all can work together, we can create change. Thanks, Nook. Um, I'd like to start as well by saying Walawani Nindiwa Muj. So welcome, friends. Thank you all for joining us this evening for the South Coast Cultural Burning Webinar, Jamanga Jamaga Ganyi, We Talk Good Fire. My name is Leanne Brooke. I am the project manager for Ulladulla Local Aboriginal Land Council, and it's my great pleasure to be co-hosting this evening with a, a lot of other great human beings that we have here tonight. Um, we, we all have such a great responsibility for country, as I'm sure you, do, you guys do as well. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that I'm tuning in from today, the UN Nation, and pay my respects to elders uh, past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that to the traditional custodians of the land that you're tuning in from today, wherever you are. Um, I guess the recent bushfires have raised a lot of concern for our environment. We've been hit hard by the Carolan fires and the South Coast with the adjoining fires. People are frightened and we want to make sense of what's happening. Um, and we want answers of how to make change and we're really hoping that tonight you will be able to find some answers and maybe some hope for the future um, and maybe some some strategy of how to um, deal with the problems that is caused by mismanagement of land um, so um, but before we get into it I'd really like to show a film as a reminder of what we all witnessed and endured last summer um, it wasn't that long ago, really, but sometimes it feels like it is. Um, but the severity of the bushfires caught international attention as well. So I'd like to show this um, feature article from Al Jazeera, if Dean, you wouldn't mind. Okay. And just while Dean is doing that, if anybody has any questions they want to pop into the chat group, um, we'll be taking note of them and we'll uh, ask those questions at the end of the session. So please feel free to just type them into the, the chat. This is a kangaroo cemetery. Yeah. There's nothing but just bones and skulls everywhere. So we're just teaching this law. It's saying like, now this country has been burnt the wrong way, you better burn it the right way. We're gonna pop in and see the owners who allowed for the cultural burn to happen on their land. I'm so lucky that we still have a green patch. So lucky that animals have a place to come. I feel guilty because of 
other people that have lost everything. Australia is in the grip of one of its most devastating bushfire crises. 29 people have been reported dead and 25 million acres of habitat have been destroyed. But fire is actually needed for many of the country's complex ecosystems to grow and thrive. Aboriginal people here have used cultural burns for over 50,000 years to maintain a balanced environment. But they say traditional knowledge has been stamped out since colonization, and they're urging a revival to help save lives. This is evident, and the people in power have to listen now. It's time, because it's the only way we're going to prevent such disaster from happening again. Pleased to meet you. you. Thanks for coming out. Yeah. I can't believe this. This oh, is. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. This used to be, or is, a national park. Yeah, war zone really at the moment. Mm. How long ago did this bushfire come through? This one come in uh, New Year's Eve. Noel Webster and Oliver Costello are Indigenous fire practitioners. Noel has lived near Conjola his entire life. I just seen all these birds just take off, fly, and I thought this is not good. That was a warning sign. Go and put some shoes on and yeah, stay tight because yeah, it's going to be an interesting afternoon. That fire resulted in the loss of 89 homes around Conjola Park, a lush lakeside town on the east coast of New South Wales. No one wanted to manage fire. The country managed it and had, this has had the result, you know, like this is a warning sign. This is, you know, tells you this is a kick up the ass. Now I know bushfires are very common in Australia. Do you feel like this could have been avoided? Definitely, they could have been prevented and, um, by doing, you know, starting camp for and, and burning country, you know, using the indigenous knowledge. That's what we need. We need to burn more often. We don't want to burn like this where everything's dead. And what was it about this forest that was so vulnerable to being scorched like this? It's the intensity of the fire. The fuel loads in there were extreme. It was just going to go and it was going to run and it was going to take off. And, um, when you say fuel, that's the debris, that's the leaves, the twigs, yeah. everything on the forest yeah. ground? There was animals here and they tried to escape, but um, there was no outlet for them. There, there was nowhere they could go. We got a carcass from a kangaroo. Really? Yeah, look, didn't make it, you know, like burnt or crisp, that's how hot the fire was. Wow, the tail? there's a tail. This animal didn't stand a chance. This is a kangaroo cemetery. Yeah. There's nothing but just bones and skulls yeah. everywhere. It's uh, heartbreaking. The, animals... the Lake Conjola fire was where this iconic photograph of a kangaroo escaping was taken by photographer Matthew Abbott. Two weeks later and still the ground is hot to touch. That it's is really hot. hot. And that was, how long ago was that? I'm not good with maths, but... Um, a couple of weeks. It's really warm. And it's going to continue But that's also, like I was saying before... From the sun? From the sun, because it's the, yeah. it's, there's no protection. There. Our canopy provides shade. Our grasses hold moisture. And it let, allows for the evaporation to get up in the atmosphere. And that's where our rain comes from on land. But when we go out and we cut down forests, we've got no leaves here for evaporation or... These trees need the, the leaf for photosynthesize. There's none of that, so any moisture that we may have is gone. This one was from lightning strike, and um, so lightning come down, he was the fire teacher and the fire law, so he teach you how to fight and work with fire. And if you don't work with him or don't understand or accept his teachings, this is the result. Part of the traditional knowledge of Indigenous peoples across Australia is to care for the forest floor by seasonally burning off fire fuel. That's grass tree. Mm. That's the fire stick. He's the first one to come back. He's giving you a tool to come back and ignite your fire straight away. It looks like some kind soul has left some food here for any wildlife that may remain. Not a single bite has been taken out of these apples. There are the ants. Noel was saying the ants are the first creatures to re-emerge after a devastation like this. They're doing their job trying to make sense of this landscape. You can tell that no animal has survived this bushfire. This is it right here? That's the house, yeah, on the side of the hill there. Wow. There was a uh, little two-story uh, place that we built and um, was home for 18 years. I can't believe this. There's absolutely nothing left. No, nothing left of the house and um, try and find the roof. Disintegrated, it's, it's dissolved. I grew up in a little shack in the bush and um, never feared of fire. Where our dad 
told us how, showed us how to um, look after the land and burn it. You know, the, the, this place is designed to burn. We need 80% of these trees and that we have need fire to crack the seeds and to put the ash on and to germinate. Um, but you must look after it. Were it you is. keeping up your traditional fire practices around your home here? Not allowed. We're not allowed. You know, so. We can't burn our own land. Like so many others, Noel and his wife Trish didn't have any insurance on their home, making it tough to start over. But that hasn't stopped them from trying to recreate a semblance of the life they had before, and a refuge for local animals and birds. Before I'd put that one in the hole in the ground, an eastern spinebill came down on this plant here and was sucking the nectar out of that grevillea. Noel and Oliver took me to visit land that had been treated by a traditional burn six months ago. So what's the technique? Like, how do you, could you walk me through it? Yeah, sure, we'll go for a walk. So we pretty much lit it up just over here. Once we all felt really good and um, we knew what the fire was doing, yeah, we sort of, we put a couple extra little spots in and just because we knew it wasn't kind of connect and join. And um, yeah, everyone was just walking around sharing story and knowledge and practice. And it was a wonderful thing. We're burning to bring native grasses back and um, That'll even give us more moisture. So what we done, we lit the fire and the fire sort of cleaned it out and cleansed it and gave it space, it gave it light, you know? So the light come through and our plants were able to germinate. How us. close did the fires get to this land? We'll go for a walk, it's right on their property, right on their boundary. We're gonna talk to the neighbor. Sounds like fire management in the traditional way is not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing relationship. Yeah. And, and adjusting your practice too, you know, is your learning as well. We're going to pop in and see the owners who allowed for the cultural burn to happen on their land, have a chat and see if they're happy with the results. There's just so much knowledge that these guys hold that, that I want to be part of. Over the years, as bushfires have intensified, temperatures are soaring, ongoing drought, have you been worried about having your fi your home go up in oh, flames? Absolutely, it, it's, a, it's a matter of time before we're impacted by fire. When it was coming, all I needed was my family to, to get out of here so I can concentrate on what I need to do. Um, I'm sorry, is this stuff right. to talk about? Sorry. Yeah. There's, there's so many emotions. Um, I'm so lucky that we still have a green patch. So lucky that animals have a place to come. I feel guilty because of other people that have lost everything. This is evidence. And the people in power have to listen now because it's the only way we're going to prevent such disaster from happening again. need to take a bit of a breath after watching that I know it's not the first time I've watched it and I think we mentioned this yesterday um Nook about how emotional every time we watch it we feel and I'm sure Gav and Leanne you feel the same so it's still very raw even though a lot of people might feel like the bush is recovering and the communities are recovering it's the reality is it's still very raw so I just want to ask you, Gav, um, you know, I know I've asked you this question before, but, you know, I could see how emotional that made you and I know how emotional you feel every time you see it and still to this day. So in terms of that recovery uh, and the, the assumption of what the recovery is and what the future looks like, you know, what is it about this scenario that makes you so emotional? Yeah, it's, um, thanks, Mon. Um, yeah, it's the, the whole picture, like watching, like I said, watching that film again um, just brings all the emotions straight back up again. And um, it's, I guess, um, it's the neglect and the poor management of the land um, that is brought upon this outcome. Um, and just, knowing that it's, it could have been prevented um, 
to a, a large extent um, if we were using um, the traditional methods um, and the tradi traditional fire practices. Um, and just like with my, um, what, I, what I've um, been through during the fires and um, watching everyone else go through the fires as well, um, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. Um, Yeah, it doesn't make sense to have such devastation. Um, it could have been prevented if we if we were listening um, and we we're putting these practices in place. Um, and just seeing seeing the devastation with the animals um, and our environment, and trying to explain it to to our son um, that this is reality for quite some time. Um, we don't know how long it's going to take to get over such devastation um, and trying to explain that to a seven-year-old is pretty hard. Um, we used to drive past, like living where we live, we'd drive past animals and um, Oscar, our son, he'd see them and it wasn't, it wasn't like a huge deal. But now when we drive past animals, he's so excited, like, because it's not a regular thing anymore. Um, and that that really hits home. I can vouch for that because I saw him today and he was telling me about some of the owls that he's hearing yeah. in the house and yeah, trying to replicate their sound. And <laughs> it was really beautiful yeah. to see that joy on his face because there's a lot of kids in this community that are, um, you know, reflecting the same stories. So. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. And um, I know you said in the film that you feel a sense of guilt because you have this green patch. Yeah. But also at the same time, do you feel a sense of pride in the fact that you did carry out some cultural burning practices around your land and now you have this safe haven that potentially was there because of those practices? Uh, absolutely, yeah, I'm, I'm so proud. Um, to, to have been part of this um, and and hanging on Victor and Nook and the, the team's every word um, and just wishing that I wrote it down so I didn't miss a thing. Um, yeah, I'm just so proud to be part of it and, and to have a little bit of knowledge about it. Um, and I just hope that other people get to experience this and, and share the same um, fulfilling holistic approach to to caring for the land and caring for our bush um, and secondary to that making it safer for us uh, for, for everyone to live out here we all live within vicinity of bush yeah but just the holistic approach is just so important for everyone to, to listen and be a part of mm, for sure I totally agree um, well, thank you, Gav, for being so open and raw and honest, um, especially given that you're still recovering and heading into a new fire season and it's all very hard to talk about. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's um, worth mentioning that um, what's happened this year is we've gone from the bushfires into COVID and none of us have none of us in the community have had a chance to, to actually unwind and debrief on what's actually happened we've just gone from one to another and so when when we do um, reflect with our neighbors or with each other it's still so raw mm -hmm. because we haven't had a chance to heal and we were planning on doing another burn this year on our property in june to try and bring back a little bit more biodiversity after the drought um, we've got it coming now with the rain, but we, we've got so much leaf litter on the ground again. And we were hoping that would be our healing, our healing process to be able to get back on the ground with community and do it again, because we just know how right it feels. 
and how much it gives you back. Yeah, so, and I'm sure everybody is feeling that way. Yeah, and I think, um, I think we've spoken about this too and it's about, and, and a big part of this webcast series is uh, the intention for it is focused around building that reconnection back to country and that relationship back to the elements um, albeit, you know, all elements, but particularly fire um, and people's relationship with fire, because at the moment there's a lot of fear around fire, flood, the wind, you know, all of those elements. And so, as you said, part of that healing process is to go through those practices. Yeah. So, um, Leanne, yeah. I might... Um, pass over to you to introduce Uncle Victor. Yeah, so um, the man of the hour, I guess, <laughs> one we've all are dying to hear. The, um, you know, um, Victor Stephenson is a well-known cultural fire practitioner. And if you haven't seen his face pop up on the telly, he must be living under a rock this year. Mm -hmm. He's also the author of this fantastic book, as mom was saying earlier, Fire Country. So I'll hand it over to you, Victor. Thanks for that, Leanne. And um, yeah, thanks everyone um, for this opportunity. I'd like to acknowledge um, country and I'd like to acknowledge traditional owners, past, present, and future, and uh, and everyone. I'd like to just acknowledge everyone. I'd just like to also thank um, Nook as well for inviting me to the seminar. And um, that's, um, you know, always there to help and support the community. And that's how it's all started out, you know. It's always started out as helping our community and looking after our country. Um, it's the most important thing. But, um, yeah, looking at what happened there, you know, those fires last year, and to see, um, you know, you know, um, the devastation across the country, everyone knows, you know, it's really sad. And everyone knows, yeah, it is a wake-up call. And... Um, you know, it was really a pity that, like Leanne said, that the COVID came through um, this year straight after such a devastation and it put the um, pause on everyone in terms of um, starting to really react in their fullest capacity. Um, so for me, it's, I don't think people have forgotten and I think people are ready to go. And actually, I don't think that, I know that because going around since the COVID, I've been able to burn since February all the way till um, last month um, and visiting communities um, all over Queensland and, uh, all, and also Northern New South Wales, um, wherever the borders would allow me to go in certain times of the year. And, um, you know, the flooding of emails from different states all over Australia you know, people are ready to go and still now I can't keep up with the emails and and can't keep up with the demand um, with um, so many people wanting to get started. And that's coming from townships from all over the country. We have a huge increase in councils, um, mayors, town mayors and, um, you know, uh, road um, mob as well, you know, like main road departments and... Uh, just so many people, um, agencies that I've never really um, seen get involved as heavily now really wanted to get things moving. And particularly in Southern Queensland, because I'm in Queensland and that's where I could only be during the COVID times when borders were closed. It's just been incredible the amount of um, Southern communities in Southern Queensland that um, are now activating. And I'll be there next week again to do some more work um, and not only with Indigenous communities, but everyone's just getting on board. And, um, and it's really great to see. But, you know, we do have a long way to go. And there's a lot of work to do. And we see, um, you know, even now I see a lot of um, hazard reduction burns that are happening and um, fires that are happening and that have been very destructive still. Um, and so we've we still haven't got the capacity within this nation to have the experts out there, at least one expert in every fire um, that understands the landscape and 
um, knows how to burn that land the right way and and for people to be able to continuously go back to that land and continuously look after that country and not just look at it once you know if they're through about two weeks of a year and burn and then walk away you know we have people that are um, prepared to learn and throw their lives at this and um, and I think that's what we need to be seeing um, a whole change because it's not just about the fire it's you know it's it's so much work as as well around that it's preventing fire in certain systems as well and it's hard work and hard yakka to do in terms of clearing a lot of the invasive plants um, you know there's opportunities economically that we need to be looking at as well with um, when we are taking away a lot of invasive plants that have um, dominated a lot of the country. Um, and those plants have value as well. And there's also the agricultural sector and farming, um, cattle farmers and even fruit farmers and from all kinds of um, backgrounds that are really interested in better managing their land. And so a lot of work I've, um, I've been doing this year um, with a lot of cattle farmers um, in southern Queensland and remote areas. And um, it's really proving that, um, you know, um, that this knowledge is so important. And it's so important in so many ways. And like I say in Fire Country, and the book is, you know, the fire is just the beginning. And it's just the beginning of, um, you know, the fire is just leading the way for so much more change and for so much more responsibility to be laid across our land. You know, we need to be looking at our water as well. And we need to look at protecting our rivers. We need to be looking at protecting our rainforests, uh, making sure that we're looking after the country so there's plenty of food for the animals. And um, we need to be looking at our education and, um, you know, uh, you know, so much to do. And, um, and, you know, like I said, you know, the fire is just the beginning of that. So it's actually an exciting time, really. And, you know, we need to be really taking notice of the indicators and the indicators of change. And change is a good thing. Um, when we're um, looking at um, change that is going to be better for our environment and for our community. But that change is based on thousands of years of people that have been on this land for so long and that didn't change. And when we go back to occupation of landscapes, you know, it goes back 60,000 years more, you know, for some areas that have been, arch you know, like had archaeological digs and have been dated at some cultural sites. And even at some of the cultural sites, there's different styles of paintings superimposed on the rock art. And when we look at the old rock art, the oldest of all art forms, it's the engravings or the petroglyphs. And those engravings date back so far, so far that we people don't know the meanings for them anymore, um, except for when they're really obvious um, in their um, presentation. But also when we look at some of the art forms as well with ochre and pigmented on the rock faces, some of them go back 60 thousand forty thousand years you know and some of them are very recent to three thousand to fifteen thousand years and this one time i was doing um a dig i would have been about 22 i think and i was with this very um um well-known archaeologist and he was name was mike Morwood, and bless his soul he's passed now and um that man came to laura and um when I was a ranger there and visited the elders there and we helped him to do a, a dig in front of a painting. And down he dug and dug and went down about, oh, would have been 14 foot down. And as he was digging down, he, he put a ladder and he made it all solid. And so we could go down this big pit and look at the, the soil, the wall. And in the wall, there was rock art uh, sorry, there was stone um, tools and bits of ochre and bits of ash and all these signs of occupation. And as he went down the wall, he would clear around them and leave them sticking half out of the wall all the way down. So as I'm climbing down the ladder, I'm seeing all this occupation going down, down, down into the soils. And then all of a sudden, there was this big gap and it was this clean dirt. And I said to him, hey, 
look here, there's all clean here. And as you go past the clean gap, hey, there's some more ochre again, and there's stone tools, and it's the same thing happening down after that clean gap. And I said to him, what's that gap there? And he said, that's a, that's a gap there where people didn't occupy the land. And um, it dated to be around 10,000 years, that, that gap. And that gap in that 10,000 years, it, it made sense to the art sites and the different styles of art um, that were older than others um, superimposed on the wall. And it made perfect sense. And what happened there it would have been climate changes or people, lands would have been more sacred and people weren't allowed to go there. It would have been a mixture of things, who knows? But at the end of the day, there was a gap. And people lived for thousands of years in a gap and they continued on living for more thousands of years and not changing and continuing to live the same way, using the same tools and being connected to the land the same way and held that law for all that time. And even when it was passed down to different people that occupied that land. And um, what I'm really trying to get at is that for thousands of years, um, people never changed the way they connected to landscapes. And that was being handed down for so long. And now we come to the, this layer of soil where we, are this, we, have, um, we don't have that connection anymore as humans. And when we look at all that human occupation in Australia being so connected to land and abiding by land and the law of nature, um, now we have these people that aren't in that, that, that same relationship with country. And we don't need to be, um, you know, using the same stone tools and we don't need to be living the same way, uh, people in country. But what we need to be doing is, is inheriting those same values and reactivating those same values um, in our lives. The way that we connect with the land and the way we respect each other and the way that we apply our, our actions to land that, um, that is the same in terms of um, looking after country and being sustainable on this planet um, and continue to have that value into the future as a people. And um, it's just so important. So at the end of the day, it, you know, the question is like, how does traditional knowledge values, um, how does that become relevant in a modern setting, setting in the modern world that we live in? And when people hear that question, they think, oh, well, we can't go back to running around naked on the landscape and living on the land like Aboriginal people did. And so it's that, that shallow view or off side of that question. But there's actually a deeper side of that. And that deeper side is really how we bring that modern way of thinking into, our, sorry, that traditional knowledge way of thinking into our modern thinking. Um, it all starts to fall into place when we start to think about how um, indigenous knowledge of land and management practices, um, the way that we look after land, um, can still be the same practices. Um, and it also is an interconnectedness and the values of interconnectedness. And when we look at indigenous knowledge systems, it's circles and one thing is connected to everything else. And how we bring that to the modern value where we're applying fire to country and it's good for our health of our communities and it's good for education for the schools, it's good for agriculture, it's good to protect our, our houses and it's good to look after our animals and our environment and it's good to protect our rivers. And you see all of these benefits that flow out of just one thing. And then when we look at the other act, action, it also connects to this everything else. And that's that's interconnectedness and that's holistic thinking and that's the way indigenous knowledge systems work and that's the way that we're not thinking and that's the way that we're not taught in schools um we're taught to think in straight lines and and when we look we looked at say if we're going to go to school we're going to grow up to be say a policeman or something and that's all you can be a policeman because that's your your um, qualifications but um you can't see past that, it's the straight line. And what that actually does, it limits us and it limits our way of thinking. It li limits how we see interrelationships within everything on our landscapes. And it limits the way that we see ourselves fitting in 
um, to everything holistically and how we throw our lives and how we can contribute in a way that just like Aboriginal people did in burning country that is linked to everything on the landscape and, and is a benefit to everything. And um, those values and way of thinking is something that we've been deprived of and through um, a different way of um, learning um, by looking in boxes and um, limiting our capacity. And that's what people would call a colonized mindset. Um, and it's not pointing fingers or blaming anyone. It's just the way that it's, it's turned out. And so when we look at um, people today, you know, all the different people in this country from different um, opinions or different backgrounds and how they see fire and, you know, it all boils down to, um, you know, they just don't know any, don't know. And you can't blame anyone for the fire. It's just the fact that people just don't know any better. And that's because people have not been taught and they don't understand, um, um, you know, how um, we've all contributed really um, to get to where we are. And that goes down to just people living in houses that um, might ring up and complain about the smoke to someone who might be in the fire, de fire department that um, is jealous to see other people doing fire and he wants to do the fire so he doesn't want to help or someone in, you know, in national parks who's scared of losing their job, so he doesn't want to support um, the programs or other people. And, and so we have, um, yeah, a very fragmented society. And at the end of the day, we can't afford um, that, you know? And it's a fragmented society that contributes to degrading environment. And, um, you know, why is it so hard for us to get in cultural burning happening? I mean, you know, we're up against everything. We're up against, um, you know, a dominant government, government, and we're up against people who um, don't want to see Aboriginal people succeed, and and you know, and people who are, have a fear. Um, you know, there's all these um, hurdles and obstacles in the way, and you know, all that um, contributes to not looking after the land all that contributes to all that fuel building up, nothing getting done. And then seeing what we saw last year in 2019. And that wasn't a surprise to me because, you know, it was been over the, the decade before that fire, I've been going up and down that um, coastline with um, the traditional owners from those areas and looking at that country and constantly seeing um, a time bomb just waiting to go off. And it did. And it's just really um, sad that it takes a time bomb um, to go off for people to start to listen. And so it's a big journey and it's a really big tur um, turning point for humanity right across the globe to all of a sudden change their ways and start looking after the land and not just looking after the land, but changing our practices as well in our modern sense. You know, it's good to see this morning uh, electric cars trying to get all over Australia. So that's a, that was good to see. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot more um, contribution in so many different ways. And the exciting thing is that people can contribute and they can be a part of it and everyone is a part of it. And if you're living in this land, then you're a part of this country. And, um, and it's about respecting people and respecting place and um, being able to um, contribute and work together. And... Um, that's where we're going to see a lot more education, a lot more practical um, workshops happening and um, not just to get people on the ground working together, black and white and just people who are living in community, um, but also um, focusing on all the agencies and um, all of those organisations that are in environment and in community well-being and, and getting them all to work together and to get away from being competitive. And that's all part of um, changing our mindset and starting to think interconnected and how we connect with each other, support each other in a modern sense and how we restructure ourselves in this modern world that is more around the, the natural structures of mother nature, which is where traditional knowledge comes from and where um, sustainable um, cultures have, been, have um, learned from for thousands of years. And um, 
So yeah, that's something that's just really interesting because you know, it's about that holistic thinking and inter interconnectedness that really is the key. And it's about listening to country and reviving knowledge from landscapes. And it's about um, working from a practical knowledge base. And um, we can only just continue striving forward to continuously um, demonstrating all of those values. I mean, just the last couple of weeks I've been doing lectures I'm not a lecturer I think I haven't got any um, qualifications there but they just maybe part-time sort of go into the uni um, through zoom and work with um, students and there were students working uh, I worked with they were doing architecture the students I was working with they were doing law there were some students that were in design and it had nothing to do with fire but it has something to do with fire because those law people studying law and they're learning all this knowledge too and bringing the bush into the cities is just as crucial as all this knowledge being um, there for the people who are living in the bush because it's all contributing because those law students are going to be the next prime ministers or the next people fighting the case or the you know next politicians are going to have a better understanding um, you know the next teachers for schools and the next chefs in the kitchens um, and this starts to show people how they can contribute and starts to show them how they start to think, well, I can do this and contribute to that and this and that. And then they start to they're thinking how their actions are linked to so much more. And that's bringing traditional knowledge values into a modern setting and um, getting humanity to go to the next level and um, in our way that we think and um, to be a lot more intelligent. Because when we look at how we were so intelligent and before we were all born, like, you know, like the old people were walking libraries and, you know, they can understand the trees and the animals and they think holistically. They understood everything on their landscape. It's just amazing the amount of knowledge. And then we come to this day and age um, and people are so detached from it that they don't, they're not walking libraries anymore. They look at the bush and they just see sticks and leaves and trees. How does that happen? How do we evolve downwards instead of evolving upwards? I mean, when we look at two sides of it, you know, like, yeah, we're evolving upwards when it comes to technology, but we're evolving down when it comes to our environment. And when we're evolving upwards with technology, that is actually bad for the environment. So, um, you know, this is really a valuable time. And, um, and I think, in, like I said before, it's an exciting time. And it really is a time, you know, the fire is just the beginning for all of us to get started. And um, for me, my hope is to see um, what I've just talked about be shared with young people, um, that more, um, that this gets into education and gives young people more opportunity to demonstrate how they can contribute and connect with their lives and um, be in a more meaningful way and to have more respect for the land and more respect for people culturally and i hope that goes overseas into different countries and so that people who aren't indigenous in australia actually are scottish or or some other um, nationality that, are, that start doing the same stuff um yeah we'll have a respect that yeah they actually do have a roots and they actually do have a connection and and um and even in australia we can they can respect people in place and they can um, contribute and um, be a part of it and help and um, and and knowing that um, you know that they are a part of it and and not sitting there saying well how do I what do I do and how do we do this and I've got no idea where to start and so that's what this is all about is getting so many people involved is to activate all the um, all the different categories of the knowledge map that feed into all the opportunities uh, and all the hard work that needs to be done right across the board um, to support such an important change um, in looking after our country and connecting to our country a lot more intimately. So I guess I've sort of spoken a little bit deeper than um, people might have thought, but at the end of the day, um, I really want to just share that with you on this webinar. Um, just to give you that deeper sense of thinking and that 
yes, you know, uh, Aboriginal knowledge in Australia and Aboriginal people in Australia are ancient knowledge system. And, but there's something even more ancient. And that's the knowledge that underpins us all. And, um, and that's where we need to be. Um, how we all fit into this picture uh, in a way that's um, respecting people and place. So my hopes for next year is, well, well my hopes from this moment onwards um, is to see the continuing um, growing of interest, is to see the workshops continue to flow, is to, to see the, um, you know, the, um, people getting trained and training programs happening everywhere and to see all different people getting involved from different backgrounds and, um, and um, all contributing to the, to the shift. And there's only one thing that, um, only one advice that, that I can really give people and that is um, just stay positive and um, don't listen to um, any, any negativity because um, that's the shallow thinking. Uh, and um, we're going for the deeper thinking, which is the truth and which is where we all can find solutions and um, hope and um, yeah, and hopefully not see such horrible um, scenes that we have been seeing in the last um, 12 months um, in this country and not just environmentally, but socially as well and around the world. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I see that there's a, a real big need for that. Um, and people are from outside Australia are also looking in and um, seeing, um, you know, some positives and some hopes that for, through the work that we're doing here in this country. And um, that goes for all of us, you know, all of us contributing, not just one person or one group or, um, you know, there's so many people contributing um, in their own ways, um, collaboratively, but overall it's a collective and it's, I think um, Aboriginal Australia should be proud um, that finally they, they've been listened to and uh, into mainstream thinking and um, being a part of a solution. Um, but we'll just have to wait and see. But at the end of the day, it will never stop and we'll keep on going. And I just hope the governments um, really um, start to pick up and really throw a little bit more trust towards people on the ground and through community. And, um, and um, we can only just keep on striving forward to make that happen as a people. Um, so thank you for listening and um, hope well that said. was- thank you. Thank you, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. Um, you're so inspirational to listen to and you do bring hope. Um, to dark, to dark times, you know what I mean? Like um, you really, really know how to touch people when you speak and you speak from the heart and you speak the truth. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I know you're a very, very busy man. So I think we should all be, feel very lucky to have had you on tonight. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, and just, just, just one last thing is, um, yeah, for those... Um, Getting Fire Country. Um, I just want you to know that that book has been written to protect the knowledge. It's been written to share the knowledge. Um, and it's been written to just try and get people to really see the big picture and understand it for, for all its complexities and layers. And, um, and um, it's really important that people understand this, the subject really clearly and the opportunities around that. Um, and, um, and it's also written in an honest way, um, you know, to um, reflect that within people, to have that honesty and to have that, that sense of courage to work together. And, and um, yeah, and I just, and I find that it's, it's really doing that for people. And I'm really, really stoked about that. And just so happy that so many people are, are benefiting from that and, and um including yourselves, you know, with your house being saved from those fires. And, you know, there's going to be so much more people in the future that's going to be in your shoes and that's going to continue to grow. And, 
and hopefully we won't just see one house, but we'll see townships that don't have to evacuate during such events. And and I just know that's possible. And um, for other people who are just writing questions there now, um, yes, the practices in America are the same, the practices in Canada are the same, but they're different. I mean, it's all based on the same um, principles to look after country, to burn for food, cultures all over the world, um, to make sure that we don't get the wildfires. And um, eventually, if we keep on going and looking after the land, then we'll see less fire um, as it becomes more resilient and, you know, the trees get older. But that's going to take generations and we need to be the turning point, like I said, and, um, and do that. But there's going to be a lot more work done. Um, and the work overseas is just as important as the work in Australia because that allows people to um, to see how special we are here in Australia and just how much opportunity we have um, for the world, but also to help people to see themselves if they're from other countries and to show them that there is a similarity, even though that we're all different. Um, and that is the ancient knowledge that I'm talking about that underpins us all. And that's what... I think we know, we need to be searching for. So um, thanks again. I just want to say to Uncle Victor, for anybody that does happen to get fire country, there's this beautiful diagram that I actually had the pleasure of listening to you explain. So maybe one day we could get you back and you could actually explain in person this diagram because I think this diagram explains, I know this diagram explains everything you've just spoken about. And for me as the president of Treading Lightly, it was so refreshing for me to hear that from you because it's definitely been, um, you know, bringing people together from across the community, from across government agencies, all of that sort of thing to work together um, collaboratively for change, particularly at grassroots level, is something that I think every community, if they, as you would know, working in Indigenous communities, if we can all concentrate on our own community as a starting point, you know, that patchwork will come together and there'll be massive change and we won't have to just sit around and wait for government to do it. We can do it at grassroots level. So I would love to get you back one day when you have some time, because as Leah, Leanne said, we know how busy you are, but it would be lovely to hear you speak about that diagram, the knowledge map. Oh, yes, that can happen one day, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully in person soon, <laughs> a face-to-face -face yeah. forum. We did have it, we did have I'm an event. And looking out for the land, yeah. Organized, but it didn't, it didn't happen because of COVID, but we're kind of really hopeful that it will still happen. Yes. Dean, did you want to um, throw some questions out really quickly before we finish up? Because I think there's a few people asking some questions. I think you're on mute, Dean. Yep. Okay, so this one's for Victor or Nook. Um, and this is from Ollie and Mary Ann. New South Wales government is now saying uh, landowners need to take more responsibility for clearing their land. Do you think that this is risk with uh, the lack of knowledge and fire potentially getting away from them? And what would be your advice? Um, what would your advice be to landowners? Well, um, firstly, my advice is to the government. Don't put out statements like that without putting out the support. You need to, people need support. You don't just say, oh, go and you know, burn in a private land or just, you know, go ahead. You, they need the help and so many private landholders need help um, to look after their land and and so many um, who've been on the land for generations don't know what to do when their land's been transformed to um, a whole lot of dominant invasive weeds or um, natives and um, you know if I was the Prime Minister which I don't want to be um, I would um, I'll be saying yeah do more burns but we need to but here's the training programs and here's the support and we're going to get um, a thousand, a hundred practitioners in the next in the next two years to help every, all different regions around the country to support everyone in um, doing the right thing for their country and and not get putting them at a risk. And because a lot of the landscapes are very 
unbalanced and quite dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. And um, that's exactly why we're coming out with fire sticks um, and talking about training. And that's why I just keep saying training, 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 but not training and then do the work, but training while we're doing it. We need to get stuck into it straight away, but we need the support mechanisms in place so that we're building the knowledge, building the practitioners and um, evolving this nation in a, in a way that, um, you know, is positive and educational and um, is also dealing with the problems at hand. Mm. Well said. Okay, you got, you got uh, Tyrone purchasing your book. What's Uncle that, Vic? Tyrone's purchased your book. You got another sale. I'm sure you'll have a few more. Um, we've got, um, so you answered the ones uh, in America. They've yeah, the same. just to give you a bit more, like, mm. if you close your eyes, you know, like I said in the fire country, you know, you just got to close your eyes and listen to the more people. I listen to them in Finland and America. I listen to them in Canada. I listen to some of them in Scotland and New Zealand. And I close my eyes and it's the same. It's like listening to the old people here in Australia, you know. And the, it's the same indicators in terms of not no more bush tucker in the bush. It's the same indicators of suppression of large fuel loads. It's the same indicators of wildfires, which is the obvious one, um, you know. And it's also the same indicators in the communities like struggling, not being heard um, for indigenous communities. It's you know the it's the same, and um, everything is identical when we look at um, our problems and everything's um, pretty identical when we look at solutions, but there is differences, same but different. And, um, and um, there's work happening in Canada that I'm involved with for the next five years. And um, of course, I don't just go for small trips and come back. I'm, I'm not going to stay there for good because we got to look after our country. <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, you know, it's really important work. And, um, and I think more work on a global sense and revealing those similarities culturally um, through old knowledge systems is going to be um, crucial uh, in maintaining the identity of landscapes, but also the identity of cultures and people. Um, you know, so very important space um, is that global one, but there's lots more work to do. And in time, there will be a lot, there will be um, lots of information that will come out of the work ahead. Yeah, I think Gavin Leanne's testimony to that, um, the stewardship model on how to connect the country and understand it and undertake the healing of country. Um, for, for us, that's empowerment, that's our reward, um, that's our payment to have that investment into these guys. And we know now that the landscape's going to be cared for, for, you know, for future and long generations. So, um, that's the work we want to achieve and we want to reach out and we want to touch with landholders and, um, and farmers and that and undertake stewardship. We want you to reconnect back to country, um, connect to place, undertake um, stewardship and we have shared responsibility and we learn and we'll invest Indigenous knowledge into your healing practices to look after country and then look after you. And um, there is big risk, you know, at this stage because the country is so unbalanced. It's, it's way out of whack. And, um, and, it, and we've seen it on the weekend. We had so-called fire experts lighting the burn here on the south coast under a hazard reduction regime, which turned into a wildfire and burnt for quite a few days. So what they've done is they're not reading country. For us, like country's boss, and that's, he has the ultimate say and tells you when to do. So he'll put indicators on country and you learn to read the country through the parent tree and through the grass. And then the synergy and the kinship of the law between those two um, helps you to manage the country. So it's about reading the landscape and applying the right practice. And we can all live in a safe environment. That's what we want. We don't want people to lose their home. We don't want firefighters going out risking their lives and not going home to their loved ones. We want healthy country and healthy people. And um, we do that through, through connection, um, sharing knowledge and story and narrative and working together as one. That's right. Mm. And, so, yeah. um, 
for yeah. Noel as well, you know, like Noel's, um, when I first met Noel, you know, and now I see Noel now, that's what we're talking about, you know, people going to that next level. And it's just so great to see um, Noel and all his work now advocating and his sons and his young nephews and that are just amazing. And, um, you know, and the young people, are, you know, like you know, when I go back 15 years, I was sort of worried about the young people, you know. I think, oh, are they going to come on board? Are they, gonna, are they interested in the land? But now, today, I can see um, we're in good hands. We've got good next generations coming up. And, um, and that's, that's something that's really um, warming for me. And that gives me strength to, to go even harder. And uh, so, well, you know, well done, Noel, and well done to all your families there. And I can't wait to see um, you um, just continue on to grow and, and to look after your landscapes. And Leanne hit the nail on the, uh, sorry, Monica hit the nail on the head too as well, you know, just got to start looking after our own backyards, just start looking after our own regions. And it's all about just getting started within our own communities. And, and um, yeah, that's where all our efforts should be focusing. And um, so our feet are on the ground all the time. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think we've covered everyone's questions. I think there was one other one about the, um, uh, somebody said, is this document helpful, which was the Royal Commission findings, um, which I do suggest everybody do take a read of and interpret um, not the way the government has, unfortunately, um, because to me, they have uh, misrepresented what the Royal Commission has said in that report. Um, but yeah, it, it is a, a good suggestion for everybody to read that report in detail, um, just to see exactly what the findings were um, and the recommendations that they made, which I think supports um, what you're doing and, and what you're saying too, Victor. So, yeah. Yeah. And looking forward to Tambourine Mountain coming up with Leighton Lee. So, um, and looking forward to working with the Rural Fire Brigade there too. Yeah. Just to, um, yeah, for Anthea Edmonds there, what she just posted there. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> That, that's a good point, actually, because um, Leanne and Gavin, you can probably, and Uncle Nook, you can probably speak um, on that as well in, in respect to working with our local rural fire services and in um, and their, I guess, kind of official, unofficial connection to the practices that you carried out at your property. Yeah, it's pretty pretty with Uncle Nick and... We learned from the very first day, there's only one fire, and that's the white fire. And, um, he stands by that. So we want to um, share that, that fire knowledge with everyone because there's so much value and so much benefit for everyone. Um, it's no good National Parks having their fire, RFS having their fire. We're doing our own fire. Like, we, we, we need the one fire, and that's the right fire. So we invite um, RFS and National Parks um, we invite everyone to come and walk country and learn. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about um, the, the fire that, that we light. We have, we have ladies and we have elders and we have our children um, on fire ground walking with us. Um, you know, there, there's no safety requirement to that. The, the safety, what keeps them safe is, is knowledge of country. So in that situation, we're in good hands. Um, Sometimes it's met with some quite a bit of misbelief from agency and services like that, where there's, you know, a lack of sort of like the planning approach because we're not reading spreadsheets or data and stuff like that. We're reading country. We know we're safe by applying the right fire to that practice. And um, we, we want to share that knowledge and we want everyone to walk with us. Um, I've been quite privileged to walk alongside Victor, you know, on country and burning, and um, I'll be forever grateful for that. And um, but his generosity, and and you see, like it, the two old people talk through Uncle Victor through his teachings, and we see that expressed. And now we see that voice being expressed from us from right down here on the coast. So when we first started to do, um, do 
cultural burn practice, we got met with a lot of negativity and um, no one wanted to support us or back us or anything like that. And the rhetoric was, you know, you don't know what you're doing. No one does that practice anymore. The knowledge is no longer here. It's all gone. But spending a few days with Victor, we learned the knowledge is always there. It was held within the landscape. So he taught us to open our eyes and read landscape and um, and we comply the five practice there. Um, we see a lot of bad practice and um, we want that to stop because it's harming our country. It's burning our canopy. It's breaking our, our fire law. And, um, and they need to be responsible and accountable for doing that. Um, there's no reason to do it. There is indigenous knowledge and an indigenous fire practice that can be applied to country in the right way to make this healthy landscape reduce the, the threat of wildfire. Um, but through teachings with Victor, like he says, the more you burn, the less you burn. And you think about that, and, and it, that made sense to some people, but in reality, you look at it because we'll burn more frequently, but we'll burn more less biomass in the future. So for us, that's a way forward, like um, getting out, developing the seasonal calendars, you know, the cultural by methodologies on country and employing that practice. Um, don't frame it in a Western framework and model that's proven to be unsuccessful. Um, time and time again, research has proven that the fire practice is not right. It's creating greater fuel load. And we're going to talk about this later on in these cinemas about recovery, I think in week three. And we'll pick through like how fires recovery. And it's it's frightening for us because what we've seen, fire will, fire will follow fire. And the recovery rate now, like we see it, the fuel load is going to be twice as much in, you know, three to six years. And that fire will rip exactly the same path as it just went. So we're up against it. We need to act now. We need the action right now. We have an opportunity to do that. We've had a big burn come through. It reset and it caused a lot of damage to our country. We got to relive that every day. Every day I've got to drive through and see this forest. It's heartbreaking, but what that started gave me resilience. It gave me a voice to stand up. And I'm not going to tolerate seeing country treated in this manner. We need to come together. We need to have strong voice and we need to work together to make this change. Mm -hmm. The knowledge is there. The practitioners are there. We just need the opportunity. They need to cut the red tape. They need to loosen the reins, and um, I'm going to steal this one off you, Uncle Vic. They have to let us in the driver's seat and give us a go. Let us drive for once. And um, and that's what we want to do, you know, like not be suppressed. The knowledge is there in the careful country, and that's what we're about. And um, so we, we come here, we, we don't script anything, you know, we just talk from the heart, talk authentic. But um, come walk country with us, that's where the real learning happens. Well said, Noel. Really, really well said. Yeah. Well, I think we probably need to, we could probably talk all night. I know I could, but um, I think there's, our viewers might be busting to get back to their families or whatever it is they've got to do. Um, yeah. And as much as we have to cut. Right, chicken and oven, then you've got to stop. <laughs> 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 I just got to do a shout out to me, Wayne Richard Kingston. <laughs> I've been dodging you down spars, but I'll see you in the aisle. I'll go the other way. But um, I'll connect with you real soon. And we'll head up to the surf club and we'll run a cinema up there. So um, thanks, mate. I've got your message. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I would love to say a huge thank you on behalf of Treading Lightly to Leanne, Gavin, Uncle Noel, Uncle Victor, um, my co-host, Dean, <laughs> who helped me set this up. Um, this is this is our first webcast ever, so um, please excuse us. I know some people have had trouble getting on, so hopefully when you watch this recording, I'll send out an email to, to everyone. Hopefully we can get some of those issues sorted. Um, yeah, and thanks for being patient with us. Uh, this is the first of many, and we've got a lot of really interesting speakers coming up over the next five weeks that I know you're all gonna really love. And this, I'm sure you've got a million questions from tonight that you, you're gonna have answered over that next five weeks. And we can then move forward together on this journey in the passenger seat with you guys.
Yeah. And next week you get to meet some of the local fire practitioners. Yeah, that's good. good stories. Yeah. 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 So next week we have a local focus. Um, so local practitioners. So make sure that you guys tune in to that. If you haven't got your tickets already, make sure you do. Um, and also um, we have some shirts available. I'll get the link. I'll talk to Monica about getting that link to you guys. All the proceeds go to Fire Sticks to help support them on the wonderful work they do. And I, I know a lot of the, um, the Fire Sticks crew are volunteers and they give their time all the time. So it would be good to try and give back in some way, even if it's a small way by purchasing a T-shirt and get helping get that message out there. I'll get our model just to stand up again and show you what the what the design is here. So you need to move your little dangly bit. So the design is the uncle. <laughs> My little dangly bit. <laughs> the design. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, is the uncle down here? And he's blowing smoke into the roots of the tree and he's connected to the tree to show that we're, we're all a part of the system. We're not above it. We need to be thinking in that holistic approach that what we give, we get back in return and we're nothing without our mother trees. Um, and then you've got this gorgeous leaf design up here and on the bottom it just says back to your roots as a reminder of where we need to be going. We need to be getting back to the, the, um, that ancient knowledge that Vic was talking about. And on the back, it'll have the Fire Sticks logo. Um, so I'll get that link. If you want to support, please buy a shirt. And it's an online shop, so you'll be able to just get it straight delivered to your place. Um, does you. anyone else want to say anything before and we head off? The artwork is actually um, being designed by a beautiful Leanne herself. So. We're really proud of you, Leanne, because that image is just absolutely phenomenal. I love it. I can't wait to get oh, thank you. my goodies. So. <laughs> thank you. And the shirts are all 100% organic, so organic cotton. So, yeah, trying to do our bit for the environment and be trade friendly as well. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks to all our listeners. Dean, do you want to back me up on that too? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so so much, guys, for tuning in. And, uh, yeah, really appreciate all the panellists. And, yeah, Victor, it was amazing listening to you. And I love how you touched on that that deeper level. You know, it's not just about the fire. It goes, it goes very deep. So, yeah, really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. Yeah, we'll look forward to um, next week. Thank you so much. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.